But I'm here not as an early child educator. My career has been exclusively in special education, and I'm a late comer, I'm a late convert uh, to, to uh, the early years, and I'll tell you why I became a late convert. So this is me at kindergarten, half day. Um, I know what you're thinking, clearly a child prodigy. <laughs> Actually, that look of terror is well-founded, because I just met my first nun a few minutes before that picture was taken. <laughs> But I've worked in a system, I, oh, this is being videotaped, sorry, Sisters of Mercy. <laughs> again, I apologize again. But I've worked in a system for 38 years that pushed for early identification and intervention in the hope that we're going to help children catch up. But Spec Ed sees early identification as somewhere around age 9 or 10. These kids start to surface around kindergarten or grade 1, and the teacher says, well, you know, let's see how they do. Let's just watch and see how they, go, how they develop. Give them time. And then they say, well, yeah, maybe he does have a weakness. Let's start a pre-referral process of documenting some help. And then they refer for an assessment, and then they get an assessment after about a year wait list. And by the time 9 or even 10 years of age, the child is diagnosed or identified with whatever, and we start the process of helping that child catch up. Well, I'm here to tell you that in 38 years, I've seen very few children catch up. Yes, some are. Yes, we've gotten better at transitioning some of these students into and through post-secondary. But for the most part, spec ed is a one-way road. Once you come off that regular curriculum, once you come out of the regular class and, and, and start requiring individualized support, there is very few roads back to the, to the, to the regular curriculum. So in about 2010, I met Jane Bertrand, and we jokingly tell the story of what happens when a special educator and an early child educator meet in a bar. <laughs> One of the two will say very quickly, oh my God, you were the sole threat to long-term employment for me. And I became really fascinated with the research on the early years from the perspective of a special education teacher. I, it was my, my Paul on the road to Damascus moment, meeting Jane Bertrand. Uh, and I, I was involved at the time with a Pratt Foundation, which is a, a philanthropic foundation in Newfoundland, and partnered with the McCain Foundation to push out uh, better public policy around uh, early, the early years. At that point, the early years report came out in 2010, and Newfoundland had the poorest model of early years in the country. Uh, and in, in about 2015, we... Um, we developed integrated governance of our early years. And that was a huge game changer. Getting all the people in the same tent and forcing them to talk together and plan together was an absolute game changer for us. Then a couple years later, we announced full day kindergarten. Huge backlash to that one when they came out. We're going to ruin education by, by forcing all those poor five-year-olds to be in school for a full day. Huge outcry. I could not go to a cocktail party without being attacked. Um, and then, the day after full day kindergarten started, everybody loved it. Everyone was on the road to Damascus when that happened. And then, right after that, about in 2017, I was appointed to the Premier's Task Force on Improving Educational Outcomes. Uh, Newfoundland struggles with its education model, and, and the Premier wanted a, a task force to look at a whole host of different things, three of which were inclusive education, student mental health, and the early years. And, I was given the easy three files to write. Out of, that, um, out of that report came the overwhelming realization that if you want a conversation on improving any outcome in education, you have to start talking about the early years. It has to be foundational to the conversations. We recommended uh, junior kindergarten, which is about to be phased in. We, uh, we recommended opening up the Schools Act to redefine the student to allow us to start, to allow the neighborhood school to start offering before and after school, uh, after hours programming. We recognize that a community's biggest resource in meeting the needs of young families is the neighborhood school. And building on that infrastructure, building on that capacity, strengthening the relationship between that school and those families will address the needs much more effectively than trying to replicate, duplicate, and create other systems of care. So, <clears throat> so that task force and the research that I came across uh, during that task force got me really interested as a researcher into what is the exact nature of ECE in preventing special education. 
So we came up with four research questions, which are here on the board. Basically, can we prevent special education for some kids? And for those kids who have an exceptionality, can we lessen the amount of support they're going to require uh, further down the road? Um, and what, what's the data say about that? So we went into the data and across the, the provinces looking for information. So the first question is, what's the context? Well, the two disciplines of ECE and spec ed have a remarkably similar process. I mean, we, we both look, you know, there's demand for both. There's both conversations around quality, certainly in the, the early year sector. Curriculum frameworks have become increasingly central to defining what is quality, and I applaud you on, 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 uh, on launching yours today. The rise of play-based pedagogy and the popularity of that, what we're seeing in education, is when we, when we introduce play, uh, uh, play in the kindergarten, we're now seeing play creeping its way up into the higher grades. We're seeing grade one, grade two, grade three teachers <laughs> saying, if they can do that, why can't we do it? Uh, and, and that's happening. And of course, the professionalization of both sectors continues to be a concern. The difference with, with spec ed, of course, is that human rights legislation mandated the inclusion of all children. Right? So we get universal access for spec ed kids under human rights legislation, unless they're less than f uh, five years of age, and that's an issue. Um, well, that's too much. We've also, but for the most part, as I said, we remain a wait to fail model. Uh, but there's been a big shift in special education, which is really central to my argument. When special education first started in the 60s and the 70s, most of the children receiving uh, supports were there because of intellectual disabilities, physical disabilities, genetic disabilities, et cetera, due to poor maternal health. Uh, and you know, a, a lot of the issues that we've since realized and, and, and have successfully addressed. Uh, and of course, low socioeconomic status continues to dominate special ed. Now, however, when you look across, the vast majority of kids who are in special education are there because of lags in literacy, numeracy, and writing. Uh, language delays, delays, and emotional behavior problems. If you look across, looking for the numbers, we, we see that about 13%, uh, 13 to 15% of the population are enrolled, of the school population are enrolled in special education. 60% are there for those three areas. These are the areas that now are much more malleable to, uh, to, the, uh, to the benefits of early child education. Looking across the country, we asked all the provinces for numbers. We got numbers from most provinces. We quickly discovered that you can't compare the numbers in Canada because the provinces simply don't keep the same data. They don't collect the same data in the same way. The diagnostic criteria are radically different. Some provinces are moving away from categorizing kids and have non-categorical models. Some provinces have really strong categorical models. And some provinces have categorical models and a uh, category for, <clears throat> excuse me, category for children who are not categorized. So when you start comparing numbers, it's a, <clears throat> it's a dog's breakfast. Well, if you look at BC, the, the, the number of uh, st students in spec ed, you have about 30% of your kids are there because of learning disabilities. 23% are there because of behavioral issues. I did not get speech language issues in my request. I'm not sure if you record them under spec ed, I suspect not. In Newfoundland, we're much more familiar. You see that those trends that we talked about a few minutes ago, they're standing up across the provinces. The vast majority are there for highly treatable areas. So can we reduce, uh, uh, can ECE reduce a spec ed? Well, we have 60 years of longitudinal data on the early years. And when you start looking at all of these studies, you start seeing trends emerge. You start seeing the same thing again and again and again. The boosts are in literacy and math, language, social emotional skills, <clears throat> low SES kids are the most impacted. Uh, some of these studies actually commented to various degrees that it can lower spec ed costs. Uh, and most of them, as Craig alluded to this morning, most of them talked about cost benefits. So the intersection, the research is the intersection between our two disciplines. The benefits of ECE are the exact same reasons why kids are in spec ed, right? So if, we're, if we're boosting these kids, then there's an impact down the road. There's been great interest. Ted, was, uh, Ted uh, Craig is not the only person who's interested in looking at these longitudinal studies as a collective. In the US in um, 2017, a group looked at 22 of these studies. 
And what they found was that you can, they said that you can reduce special education by at least 8%, that you can improve grade retention by 8.29%, and increase high school uh, comp, uh, graduation by over 12%, because the very things that ECE focuses on are the things that prevent or that causes kids to land in SES. What's important here is that they're looking at studies that are older. Right, so the number, the impacts, the, the, the amount of lowering seems low, 8%, it does not seem to be a lot, although it's a fortune. But in the next few slides, I'm gonna start talking about some uh, more modern studies. <clears throat> Craig's uh, study was really interesting because, the Ready for Life study, because he talks about the cost benefit. And if you consider who's in special education, yes, you know, if we invest more in the early years, we can lower the cost of spec ed, but the return on investment across these children's lives is profound. Very few kids in spec ed graduate, very few kids go on to post-secondary. The impact of them financially is significant across their lifespan. A Couple weeks ago, this presentation was done, and lo and behold, another group, this time in Europe, started to look at the European longitudinal studies. They felt that ECE in Europe is much more a universal, they have different broader set of kids in there, um, in, in, uh, enrolled, and they wanted to see whether or not the findings, the boosts that we're seeing in American studies holds up in the European context. So 17 studies, nine countries, 1,600 kids. 60% of these studies only track to the end of elementary, but what they found was the exact same thing that is being found in American studies, that language, literacy, and math is the biggest boost, and that there's no fade, that th th these boosts do not fade over time and they spoke to the need, the policy implications of this. They also spoke to the need for professional development to make sure this happens. <clears throat> the largest uh, longitudinal study is perhaps the EPI data, data set, which many of you are familiar. Uh, Ted Mellution, a whole bunch in the UK, tracked 3,000 students beginning in 1997 huge data set that's still in existence. It's been extensively reported on, and there's been a number of follow-up studies that came out of that. And again, they found that students with two years of high-quality ECE had the gains that you see there. Language, literacy, um, self-regulation, social skills, post-secondary participation, on and on. You've heard them all by now. But the epicenter, the epi study was significant because it was the first time they really spoke to the difference between low quality ECE and high quality ECE. They found that you know, all kids benefit, but the boost for kids with high quality is much more significant. They also commented that, they, and they looked at two years, so there's a dose and quality. A two year dose and a high quality, you get a big impact. They also commented that kids who had additional ECE prior to age four had an even bigger, bigger gap, a bigger gain. <clears throat> One of the follow-up studies on the EPI data set was a study called the Etson study, the Early Years Transition and Special Needs. They looked at kids with spec ed uh, issues, and they compared the kids who did had, had, were home, stayed, stay at home kids who had no uh, exposure to ECE with kids who had two years, and the impact was significant. 51% of kids, of home kids, were at risk for cognitive development, whereas 21% if they had two years experience. 44% uh, percent of home kids were at risk for reading compared to 23%. 51% at risk for social struggles compared to 21% for those who had two years quality. So an, a, a second in-depth look at the EPI study started to pick it apart even further. I should say that there was a third study done on the EPI uh, data set and attracted kids, this was into grade two, uh, but they, the second study tracked the kids into grade five, and I didn't report that here because that third study, sorry, that study looked to see what factors can predict special education needs, and they came up with all kinds of things like birth weight, mother's education level, socioeconomic status at home, and, and including um, enrollment in the, in the early years. I'm gonna come back to the, the Essence study later. In Ontario, as we speak, there is a longitudinal study going on that takes what we mean by quality up a notch. So they are, as you know, Ontario uh, started to phase in um, uh, uh, full day kindergarten and, and junior kindergarten, allowing a control group 
So Jan Pelche and her team started to track the kids who had the two years experience compared to the kids who did not have them. And she's tracked them through now to, I think, grade five, Jane? Grade five, grade six? Grade six now. Um, 600 students, very diverse groups of kids, very, you know, very uh, ethnically diverse and economically diverse. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing about, the thing about taking um, quality up a notch is that these children are in the same classroom, in a mixed ability group, four and five year olds, with a, a kindergarten teacher and a trained early child educator who have a mandate to collaborate and they hold the kids for two years. So at the end of those two years, that instructional team really knows the child and really knows their families. What Jan found was that, uh, what Jan found up to in grade three, full day kindergarten significantly higher in all areas. Again, same thing coming, coming through. Uh, also a high in number, not, uh, um, number knowledge and writing. She also found a very important thing, that these kids, because they were in the school with wraparound services before and after school in the same site, in their, and she interviewed all the kids, the kids who had the stable site spent most of their time talking about play. The kids who had to change sites spent most of their time talking about who got them where, right? They were in survival mode. They spent most of their day in coping mode around how I got there, how I got there, who brought me, what, who was late, and spent very little time talking about play, right? Because they were in a stressed environment. And of course, what we're finding is that ECE and full-day kindergarten teachers are increasingly learning to be more collaborative. So, we were really interested in, the, in, all, in all of these studies say the same thing for the most part, but we wanted to go back, back to the EPI data set, which is still in existence, and back to, to, uh, to Pelche's study, and say, dig deeper. Look, you know, for, for uh, take a closer look. We asked Malouche to, to take it right through the high school graduation. Instead of asking which kids got referred, we wanted to ask which kids are at risk for referral. Because now with the models of inclusion and with different policy and funding, there's all kinds of hidden bias around whether or not a child will be referred. If there's programs uh, that carry extra money, there's gonna be more children referred to it. If you have a teacher or a program or a school that is highly inclusive, they're gonna refer less kids to spec ed. So we wanted to measure which kids are at risk of special education needs if they are more than one standard deviation from the mean in, a multiple, in multiple domains. And what we found was really interesting. I should say that these articles, these two studies will be published uh, shortly. Epi went back and from birth to high school graduation, the kids who had low quality early learning, 36% reduction in cognitive risk at age five, compared to those with high quality, 45% reduction. And it held right through all of the other, multiple, the other indicators as well. 40% reduction in risk for cognitive risk by age 16, 55% reduction in cognitive risk by, by age 16. Stark, powerful numbers. And, and if you listen to Craig, like if these are high numbers, take the lowest number and it's still very impressive, right? He, he, they tracked for uh, social behavioral risk as well, uh, but there was a problem with how they measured social emotional risk in that they used teacher checklists and they found that they were very subjective. And one of the things that was happening with the kids who had the highest risk for behavioral issues, they started to disappear as they moved into the higher grades. They started to drop out, right? Or be reassigned to another school. Um, but the EPI data set is, is, is very, very powerful. Malusha's article on this will be released soon. It is in a, 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 a Pracy's office is in our report and is accessible as well. So we asked Jan to do the same thing in Ontario, Jan Pelchi in Ontario. Go back and look at which kids are more than one standard deviation from the mean in self-regulation, vocabulary, and reading. What she found was kids with half-day kindergarten were three times more likely than kids with the two years experience to be more than one standard deviation, right? Three years in self-regulation. Self-regulation is huge in behavior management, as you well know. If a child can't regulate their behavior, they are going to be a challenge in the school and they are going to be at profound risk for mental health issues. One of the issues that we had in Newfoundland that came about with, uh, with um, 
uh, integrated governance was that we realized that we had to start embedding social emotional learnings in our curriculum frameworks and start training our kindergarten teachers to do the same. And we quickly realized, wait now, hold on, where are the early child educators? Why are we not focusing on embedding social emotional learnings in the curriculum frameworks for the early, early years and training our early child educators? If we do a good job on training them, we don't need to train the primary and elementary ones near as much. As Ted said this morning, it's much easier to cause a problem before it manifests, solve a problem before it manifests than try to address one after. Vocabulary, half-day kids were one and a half times more likely than the full-time kindergarten- full kids to be more than one standard deviation. And reading, they were twice as likely. Right? Stark numbers from very current ongoing studies. <clears throat> so what we see to the answer to our first question really is that we have multiple evidence, multiple lines of evidence from multiple sources on the preemptive nature. In fact, we get an overwhelming message that we can prevent special education. How much? Well, that depends on the quality. Right? Um, <clears throat> uh, what else do I want to say this? And the Ontario study, I keep plugging the Ontario study. Now, this study is vital for us to keep tracking these kids to see the impact of such high quality uh, um, uh, ECE on, on these kids' development because, well, you all know what's going on in Ontario and that's probably at risk of being cut. So I'm constantly plugging that. So let's move on to the second question. What about the kids who, who have exceptionalities? And we know that those kids, you know, what's the, what's the impact for them if they are in early child education? Well, first, we asked, looked across the country looking for numbers, trying to quantify how many kids, how inclusive the early year sector was. And same issue. The provinces do not collect the same data at the same time in the same way. So comparing numbers is almost impossible. Three Atlantic provinces collect this, the data in the same way because they work collaboratively, coincidentally, on defining how to collect their data. So we know that you know, about a third of the kids in Newfoundland are in early child uh, regulated space, but very few of those children are there with exceptionalities. And that, that stands up across the country. Many reasons for this, many reasons for this. Um, the diagnostic nature of, you know, uh, many children aren't yet diagnosed. Some are in the process of being diagnosed. The whole debate on whether or not we need to diagnose children is also there. But we know from uh, the international literature that, you know, OECD says about 25% of children with exceptionalities have access to, um, to early learning centers. We also know there's studies out that show that children with uh, exceptionalities are at huge risk for being expelled from early learning centers. Autism kids, which I'm going to speak to in a second, in particular. Kids with behavioral challenges um, are, are, are often out as well. All of the provinces have inclusive policies for the early years. Every one of them, read those policies, stellar policies. Practice is a different story. And in, in large part because extra needs means extra hands. It's a HR issue, and it's a training issue that quickly emerges. It's not that they don't want these children there, it's that a, 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 accommodating them can be a challenge. The federal bilateral agreements actually prioritizes making ECE more inclusive. Right? So I call the early years as the last frontier of inclusive education. It's the last area that we really need to start doing research, we need to start looking at practice, not policy, uh, to make sure that these centers are, um, are increasingly accessible. The early child education report, 2017, that started in 2010, looking at um, uh, monitoring quality ECE across the country. One of those benchmarks uh, calls for funding to be conditional on including children with special needs. That benchmark has hardly moved since monitoring began. It's met by only two provinces and it's partially met by three. So the vast majority of the country has, has not responded to that benchmark. Um, um, reflecting what we already know. The ECE sector is not that inclusive for uh, children with special needs. Yes, there are challenges. Yes, there are limitations. Yes, it's hard work, but we know from all of the research on inclusive education in the primary, dominated by research in the primary grades, there's many, many benefits for children, for families, for parents, um, and for educators to have inclusive environments. And the pros and the cons should balance out at the end of the day. Yes, it's harder work, but it's so important we should be trying. 
We should be moving towards it. Families in particular, the financial strain on families, young families, with a child with exceptionalities is profound. Profound, especially if you have a child with complex needs. And it's maternal employment that gets to hit. To hit. Dad doesn't take time off work, mom has to take time off work. Mom has to give up her job because she can't find placements for her kids. And the impact of that is significant. So this, this growing research you know, for continuity of learning here, if we can establish homeschool relationships early for these children with complex needs, there's a payoff down the road. If we can get to know these families, earn the family's trust, establish communication with them, it's a lot easier when they come to the school system. If teams are established early, you can speak to these families now and look at their schedule. There are a whole list of people who are involved in their lives, and scheduling is a nightmare. And there's all kinds of relationships that change by the hour as practitioners change. So we can afford, establish better interprofessional teams early on that tracks the kid as they move forward. It will be easier when they hit the school system. Um, the irony is that many young, uh, many early child educators are increasingly doing a good job on documenting the needs of children, what works, what doesn't work, how to support this family. They send that package on to the school, and more often than not, the school says, oh, God love you, thank you very much, but I'm going to form my own opinion. I'm going to wait and see, right? Let's give him some time. And it's not looked at. It's not reviewed. Even, even in my experience, even... Professional support plans coming from speech therapists or ed psychs or physiotherapists, that's not looked at. In Newfoundland, if they're followed by a speech language ther therapist in the zero to five age range, that therapist stops their work at the fifth birthday, transitions the child to a school based speech language pathologist, right? And it all starts again with a new wait list. And that's increasingly reflective across disciplines and across practices. The bottom line here, I think, is that. If these children can have supports identified and in place earlier, when they land in kindergarten, they're going to have a radically different experience. We can be proactive around program planning. And it's interesting, the OECD, and with integrated governance, is a real opportunity for this to occur. If they're all in one tent, we can be really good at transition planning, we can be really good at sharing and program development and whatnot. But OECD did a study on this in 2018, 2017, and what they found was that integrated governance alone is no guarantee that collaboration is going to occur. That happened in Newfoundland. We housed them in the same corner of the building, uh, but they didn't collaborate until the task force came along and made a whole series of recommendations that they had to start collaborating, and the difference is stark. The difference in effectiveness is pronounced. We need continuity of programs, con continuity of policy, training, and pedagogy. We need to start looking, if we're, pro if we're doing professional learning for early child educators or for kindergarten teachers, we need to be doing that collaboratively. We need to get these people together and start tra training them collaboratively so they can start sharing their skill sets. And that's part of the reason why we need to keep the study in Ontario going. So we took an in-depth look at autism. Without question, kids with autism are the most challenging kids to program for, young kids in, in the school system. They are resource heavy and they are, are, are fairly intensive. Uh, we know that one in six children in Canada will develop or will have autism. We know that rate is going up. Most school systems, this is no news. We live this every single day. 56% of these children are diagnosed during the early years and 75% by the end of primary school. So these kids are being identified during the very years we're talking about, right? We also know that the preferred, the, the evidence-based uh, interventions for these children are programs such as ABA and JASPER, which really focuses on developing a child's communication ability, settling their uh, sensory needs, and settling, uh, addressing their sensory needs, and settling disruptive behaviors, right? <clears throat> That's the intention of those programs. If we look across the country, there is profound variation in the models of early support and access for, uh, uh, for children with autism during the early years. We see families actually move provinces to access service. Autism par parents of autistic kids are become the most mobile families out there who literally have to hop provinces trying to get different supports for the young kids. Um, these kids, most of these kids, in the K-12 system or in the earlier system, these are the kids who are sent home most often. 
The school system will literally call and say, come take him. And the parent says, I can't, I'm working. Too bad you have to come and take him. Right? I rail against that. I absolutely rail against that. <clears throat> Sending a child with autism home is because of their behaviors is the exact same thing as you or I landing in the emergency room and the doctor saying, oh my God, yes, you're sick, but you're too sick for me. Go home, get a bit better, and then come back. <laughs> we cannot shirk our responsibility to meeting the needs of these kids. It's complicated. It's complicated, it requires additional resources, it requires additional training, absolutely, but we cannot say, take them home. It's against the Schools Act. No one has the authority except the minister to send the child home, right? be it from an early learning program or from a grade seven program. Right? That's a pet peeve of mine. We also know the financial impact of, on these families, and I said earlier, especially mothers. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and this is an area rich for research. Supporting kids on the spectrum in the early year centers is a huge area of, of critical importance. Let's look at, we also looked at mental health, right? Um, because mental health has become so topical, right? It's, it's, it's a great concern across the country, and rightly so. Uh, we see there's a rapid rise in student mental health concerns, but trends are difficult to identify. It's difficult to quantify how much mental health is up across the country because of data collection and whatnot, and also because DSM-5, Diagnostic Statistical Manual 5, completely redefined what it means for, uh, for many of these. Much of the diagnostic criteria was radically changed about 10 years ago. So tracking ch uh, uh, trends is difficult. Um, we did look, at one point I looked at the pharmaceutical rates, and that's where you see an increase. The rates of uh, pharma, uh, pharmaceuticals assigned or prescribed for mental health issues in young children, those numbers are up. <clears throat> Overall, though, we know about 10 to 25% of young children are impacted at some point with, an, with a mental health issue. Um, most of them go unaddressed for many reasons. Biggest one being access to service. Second biggest one being stigma, right? Um, uh, and transitions raises the, the, uh, the stress of these children. We know that Jan Pelche showed that in her Ontario study. Uh, disrupted, um, disruptive or inconsistent, unstable early year programs is extremely stressful for children. We know as well that um, the mental health of the early child educator is critical. There are studies out there that show that as the stress level of the early child educator rises, the stress level of the child rises, right? There's a perfect correlation. Um, and uh, we also know, as Ted said this morning, once these maladaptive behaviors are entrenched, they are really difficult to redirect, right? So the big thing for me around the, the mental health, what the research says is that the three big boosts that come out of quality ECE is language, so social skills, and self-regulation, those are the inoculative factors against mental health. If a child has the ability to express themselves, to talk about their feelings, to understand and interact and converse with those around them, if a child can form and maintain relationships with peers and with others and interact in a socially appropriate way, and if a child has the ability to regulate their behaviors and emotions, they are at significantly reduced risk for mental health issues especially for children who are at most risk, especially for the children who are raised in chaotic homes or unstable homes or in poverty. I want to speak for a second on the importance of early curriculum frameworks. And I mentioned that I'm really pleased to see, uh, to see that you've just launched yours, which I have a copy of, which I will be reading on the plane tomorrow on the way home. Uh, and if I have any concerns, I'll email when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> My guess, without even opening the cover, my guess, looking at curriculum frameworks across the country, my guess is that it does not go deep enough around social emotional learnings. And it does not go pragmatic enough around social emotional learnings. That having cracked the cover of your report, so this is just my guess. Uh, because that's what's happening in other frameworks. We know that we need explicit social emotional learnings embedded strongly in the, in the curriculum. We need educators strongly trained on how to deliver that and in good responsive teaching. Uh, and <clears throat> we know that the training 
to meet those outcomes has to be, uh, be ongoing and, and sustained. And it has to be linked with the K-12 curriculum. That, that continuity of pedagogy and, and program is absolutely essential for social and emotional learning. These kids need to, be, need to have the same skills reinforced over and over again as play occurs. In special education, the way we teach social and emotional learning is that we do role plays. Right? So we sit down with an eight-year-old. Okay, Johnny, let's role play. The way early child educators teach social and emotional learning is that they reinforce it as it happens. When Johnny and Betty are having a conflict or when Johnny's having a struggle, the early child educator uses that struggle to reinforce right? and to teach. And if there's continuity around training and, and outcomes, then it's reinforced again and again and again. And if it's done well during the early years, the need to do it in the higher grades starts to drop off because the kids develop the skills. And if I'm wrong in your, your curriculum frameworks and if you've done an exceptionally good job on social and emotional learnings, I will email and <laughs> congratulate you. <clears throat> Play-based pedagogy is also critical to the mental health of children because it reinforces the natural interactions of children as they happen, as they interact with one another. Right? Um, it pushes out emotional regulation. It pushes out physical development. Physical development is a, is a big issue. If there's any occupational therapist in the room, you're going to say, yep, yep, yep. A friend of mine is an occupational therapist, and she, used to say, she says, five years ago, children used to skip into my room, and it took me two days to teach them how to ride a bike. Now it takes me a week to teach them how to skip. Right? Because play has changed so much. Right? The motor development in children is not occurring. And there's all kinds of issues coming out of that, including sensory issues. Um, play facilitates higher cognitive processes, greater creativity, a desire to belong. It's interesting to see the power of play in an, ele in an ele primary school that just implemented full day kindergarten with play based. The teachers literally looked into the classroom and thought, oh my God, thank God I'm not teaching in there. And then a couple months later, they see all the kids coming from the playground with their leaves or their rocks or their trees, laughing, going back to do, and I, I want to do that. Why can't I take my kids out on the playground? Why, can't, why do I have to stay in? So we're, we, we, when full day kindergarten started, the backlash was we're schoolifying early childcare. But what we're discovering is that we're playifying, we're playifying education. And the impact is significant. And it's most significant in these issues. So over the years, we know that free play has declined and mental health has increased. There is a correlation. There's a perfect correlation here. So conclusions. So again, multiple lines of evidence. We feel that children with special education needs who will always need support can have a radically easier transition to school if we start earlier. Families of these kids can have a radically different experience. We can form stronger relationships with the ones who are most difficult to engage. We can earn their trust. Right? Most, most parents of special education kids will say, it's always a battle. Every September, I have to go back to battle, back to war for getting the supports for my child. We should not need to do that, knowing what we know. The earlier we engage, the better. And the impact is undeniable on, me on mental health and uh, behavior regulation. So we started this with a need to create a shared lens, to look you know, at the early years from the perspective of both an early child educator and a special educator. I think where we're ending up is the need for greater collaborative focus on inclusion. Right? We need to look at, at uh, we need more research in many of these areas. This is an area that the research in the early years and the research in special ed has been completely separate over the years. We need to start bringing some of that together. Uh, we need to start looking at practice, portfolios, IPPs, individual plans, following these kids through, right? Because an early child educator will tell you what works and what doesn't work. Kindergarten teachers should be listening to that and they should know it well in advance. Professional learning, as I mentioned earlier, we need to look at at uh, collaborative professional development between the two sectors and allowing them to train one another. Um, and policy that ensures inclusive education. So the report that we did is available. There's the URL. 
all the references, all the, I, I didn't put the references here just out of space on the slides, but all the studies, all the research is there. If you can't get it, uh, I'll email you a PDF. And in um, November, uh, maybe early December, we are releasing a special edition of uh, an international scholarly journal, Exceptionality Education International. It's a very highly regarded special education journal. We have convinced the authors to do a special edition. And in that special edition, I think we have nine articles. Ted Malouche, Courtier, mine is there. There's one on mental health, there's one on autism. There's one on documentation, there's one on transition plan. So what we're doing, we're really starting to jo try and join the two disciplines, and there's no way to get special education academic scholars to start thinking about this than to publish in their world, right? No one else reads that world, but they read that world, uh, and solidifying this in the, uh, in the literature. So both of these are accessible, and I'm accessible. Right, so that's my email address. I'd be more than happy to respond to emails um, or for documents. I'm not sure how we are for time. I'm totally unaware. Okay, am I as perfect as Craig Alexander? Yeah. My people will be surprised to hear that. <laughs> Thank you.